Isn't God good? Isn't he good? How many of you have had God change your life? Has Jesus changed your life? Give the Lord a shout this morning. Come on. Glory! Glory! Oh, God, you are so good to us. You are so good to us. room amen isn't it an amazing thing that God's presence is in this place God decided that he was going to make a way for us to have relationship with him but not only that that we could have constant contact with our father amen that wherever we go he goes wherever he is or we are he is God's word says that where two or three are gathered he's there in the midst of them but you know what It also says that he takes residence in my heart. He walks with me every step that I take. So I'm glad that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is in this place. Amen. God, we love you. We thank you that you are here this morning. God, we thank you that you are here this morning. Awesome and power. 
awesome and power, reigning forever, light of
With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Thank you, Jesus. There's coming a time when a trumpet is going to sound. The Bible says the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And we which are alive and remain, we're going to join them. During that season, coming a time when we are going to sit around a table together. Jesus said when he shared what we call the Last Supper, can I tell you it's not the Last Supper, it's the Last Supper here on earth with Jesus. There's coming a day when he's going to gather his people together. They're going to sit at that table, marriage supper of the Lamb. And once again, there's going to be the eating and the drinking like there was at that supper in the upper room. You say, so why do you do this? Because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me until I come. So every time I open the bread and every time I open the cup and every time I receive, I'm being obedient, but I'm also practicing for that day. And I don't know about you, but that causes me to take the bread and the cup with not only thanksgiving, but a rejoicing heart. Amen? A rejoicing heart. So Lord, we thank you for the bread and the cup. We are grateful for the price you paid. This morning, as we receive it, we don't do it with sorrow. We, we do it with thankfulness. And we do it with joy. Because we know the day is coming and it's getting closer. Lord, when we will once again sit down with you at that table and receive the bread and the cup. So, Lord, this morning, for everyone who knows you as their personal Savior, we say, Lord, we say, Lord, we say, Lord, come quickly. Come quickly, Lord, because we're looking forward to that day. Lord, we receive this bread and this cup today in thanksgiving and in rejoicing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can receive the bread and the cup. take um, a couple of extra minutes this morning. We try not to take too many minutes before the preaching of the word, but I want to take a couple of extra minutes to do something really important. We've been praying about, we've been thinking about doing something that I think that needed to be started. And um, we have so many volunteers at Revival Center. We are one of the blessed churches of this community because we have so many people who share in the workload. How many of you know that many hands make the work light. And uh, so when you volunteer to do something at Revival Center, uh, it's ministering in the kingdom and it's ministering to brothers and sisters in Christ and it's ministering into a lost world as well. And we're thankful that you do that. Well, we want to honor um, a couple that is uh, with us and has been serving faithfully for a long, long time and sometimes without any real recognition. And uh, they are Gary and Thelma Merritt. They serve as the directors of our food pantry. And we have a card for you 
and a gift in it. And if you guys would come, we want to give you a big hand and we want to thank you. Yeah, yeah, they deserve, they deserve it. Come on, Gary, stand up here with us. Praise the Lord. They deserve it. We know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they are such a wonderful blessing. And uh, they just serve, and they serve, I wouldn't say tirelessly, they just continue on when they're tired. And they do what they can do to make a difference uh, to the people of our community. They are truly blessing the poor. We say Revival Center is here to bless the children, the poor, and the saints. And they have taken upon themselves that heart to bless the poor of our community. And we just wanted to thank you guys and tell you how much we appreciate you doing this and uh, you being a part of serving in this area. Thank you so much. So give them a big hand again if you can. Thank you. Well, I'm what? Today is Selma's birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. A big birthday, 75. 75 years young today. Amen. If you've ever wondered if you were too old to serve in the kingdom, it's just not true. There's never a time. Somebody said, uh, what does retired mean? It just means that you're ready to uh, do it again. Okay. God is good, isn't he? So I wanted to um, talk to you about a couple of things this morning before we give you an opportunity to give um, of your tithes and offerings. One, some of you noticed several uh, weeks ago, it was actually about a month ago now, that we instituted a policy about not having, um, not having food or drink in the sanctuary. And those of you who had um, never brought anything but water in or didn't bring anything in, you applauded us and said we did a great, great job because you never brought anything in before. It didn't affect your life at all other than you were glad everybody was doing like you were now. I want you to know something. We didn't do it to please you. Okay. Now, for those of you who now think that um, somehow or another that uh, we have gone into a Gestapo state because we don't allow coffee in the sanctuary right now, here's what I want to tell you. First of all, if you don't like that policy, you can look squarely at me because I presented it to the deacons. It was my idea and nobody else's, okay? And I'm going to tell you why I presented it to them. Because I do weddings and funerals here and on a regular basis, we have folks come and join with us on Sundays that have never been here before. And I'll tell you this much. You may not notice all of the coffee stains all over the carpet in every place in this building, but they do, okay? And, um, and it is a problem, okay? And if it was a problem that was easy to solve, it would have been solved. We have multiplied times cleaned the carpet. We have asked the best people in the world who say, I can get a stain out of anything to help us with that. We haven't been successful at that yet, okay? We've even been looking at a different floor surface so that that's possible because the truth of the matter is, I am one of the people who like to bring coffee into the sanctuary. And uh, so I am one of those people. So I was the first one to not be able to do it. And this morning, I caught myself doing the very thing I told everybody not to do. And uh, so I had to go out. I had to, like, go, oh, my goodness, I'm in here. I can't believe I did that. I hope God doesn't strike. No. See, this is not a God thing as much as it's, it's because we have all kinds of wonderful activities that happen in this room. Somebody said, well, this is the temple of the Holy Spirit. No, this is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Okay, any one of you that think that a physical building is the temple of the Holy Spirit doesn't know the scripture. That was Old Testament, New Testament says, I am, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that wasn't it. It's not a theological thing. So don't say amen to a theological thing. It wasn't that. It's just the fact that we want to make sure that this space is a space where we can, we can really, you know, bring people in and they can, they can see that we take good care of it. If and when there comes a time that we can solve the problem, or if any of you have an answer to the problem, 
something that's less than frivolous, please let us know because we would try and solve that problem. And, uh, but I want you to know it's me. If it causes you to think, I need to find another church, well, good luck because none of them except us allowed coffee in the sanctuary. Hello? And if you think that you need to go somewhere else because of that, then that's a pretty sad way to treat your family. Okay? I wouldn't leave you for something as frivolous as whether or not in a two-hour period I could drink coffee in that space. Okay? So, that being said, smile at me and say, it was pastor's doing. So don't blame anybody else. And if you want to have a talk with me, I will listen to you intently, and then I will talk to you. Okay? That's my opportunity, too. All right. Is, is that good? It's just a little housekeeping thing, okay? It's just a little housekeeping. It just is what it is. And uh, we would love to change it, but we just don't know how, yet how to do it, okay? We've talked about other surfaces, and if we can make something work, we will. Now, I want to talk to you about this weekend. Because this weekend is a big weekend, and I'm going to tell you why it's a big weekend, and, and this is something you need to hear. During, somewhere after the beginning of 2021, I really felt like the Lord spoke to my heart about how this place would be a revival center, a place where revival is. And uh, I believe that the Lord spoke to my heart about it being a catalyst for revival a number of years ago, a catalyst for revival in northern Michigan. But... How do you cause that to happen? One of the things that the Word of God says is that there's five kinds of ministry that are intended to help us become ministers, okay? So in other words, we're supposed to train people up so that they can be ministers and they can be full of the Holy Spirit and they can be on fire for God, okay? And so, so what, what, what I really felt like we needed to do is, okay, well, who are those people? There's apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. There are. They are meant to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. They still exist, okay? And, uh, but here's the thing. We don't have all of them at Revival Center, okay? We want all of them at Revival Center, but we don't have all of them. So this summer, during what we call the Summer of Glory, we brought in a true, tried and true evangelist, a man who's won hundreds of thousands, not hundreds, but hundreds of thousands of people to Christ. And we said, come on in. And show us what that looks like. And what he showed us that it looked like was actually taking the gifts of healing and the word of knowledge out onto the street. That's a powerful thing. And when you do that, people get saved. Okay? I don't know that we've all done it, but we've now been exposed to the idea of taking gifts of healing and a word of knowledge out onto the street. And then we thought, well, who can we bring in next? And I really felt like it was very important that we bring in people who have true prophetic giftings. They're not just a person who can flow in the gift of prophecy in the local church, but they are actually prophets indeed, okay? Now, here's the problem. In my lifetime, I've met a number of people who said that they were prophets, and they were actually a little flaky. I'm just telling you the truth. So I struggled with that. And I'm like going, okay, well, who can I find? And the Holy Spirit really spoke to my heart about people I've known since they were teenagers, okay? Okay. And, and I've known them to have pro not only prophetic giftings, but to be prophets in the, 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 the kingdom of God. And, and so we invited them, Dan and Cindy Wormuth, who are also pastors um, at, at uh, Joplin Family Worship Center in Joplin, Missouri, and Calvin and Becky Day, who have served as resident prophets in the house where they are at in Michigan. I invited them to come. And I'll tell you why. Not so that you would all become prophets. But the Bible says, this is really important. Paul, who believed very strongly in speaking in tongues. How many of you know that? But he also said, I would rather when you're in the building or among other people, I'd rather you all prophesy. Not one or two, but all prophesy. So how does that happen? I think that it happens when we're exposed to the gifts of prophecy and the prophets themselves, okay? So we are bringing these folks in. They will be here Friday night. There's going to be a, a, like a little salad bar thing earlier at 6, and then there's service at 7. They will be here on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, two separate sessions, and then they will be here Saturday night 
I will be preaching on Sunday morning um, about the, about the um, I am convinced um, that everything works out for our good, and it's all part of this thing, and then they will be ministering again Saturday night. They will be doing, they will be speaking words out over our congregation, but for anyone who really feels like, you know, you need to hear something that's going to confirm what God's already been speaking to you, because you know what? We don't go to prophets to hear a word. We go to prophets to actually have a word confirmed. Do you understand what I'm saying? And God's been speaking to you. You're a Christian and he speaks to you. But anybody that wants to have a word spoken over them is going to be welcome to do so. We encourage you to bring your smartphone and record what is said so that we can make sure that it's highly accountable. And, and in do, what? Your smartphone. Do you have a phone? Is it smart? Okay. It's also got a recording opportunity in it, okay, so that you can record what is said. So that, and, and here's the thing. We're just going to expose ourselves to prophetic giftings. And there's going to be a period of time. They're going to teach about it, what it is like, what it means, and then there's going to be impartation as well. And uh, we're going we're gonna to begin to see the prophetic gifts flow at Revival Center. If you don't have one of these this morning, take one with you. Find one, some, one that gives one to you as you leave and get one of these and take it. And please plan on coming to as many of these meetings as you possibly can, okay? Because I believe that it's that important. And um, we're, we're having other people come in um, during the, re not, not through the end of this year, but through the, the period of time into 2022, we're going to be exposing ourselves to apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Okay? You say, why are you doing that, pastor? Because I believe we're supposed to be a revival center. Okay? So that's why. Okay. I had something else I was going to tell you. Hmm? Oh, next week, not next week, two weeks from today, two weeks from today, we are going to be having, oh, I, no, I, you're, you're ahead of the game. Next Sunday, what that means is this, though, we're going to have a joint service with our early service and our second service, and so this service will begin at 10 o'clock. If you show up at 1045 like normal, Can I tell you this much? Being late says something about us. Okay? And it doesn't say the right thing. Be early. Okay? I believe that early is on time. On time is late. Late is unacceptable. Okay? Be early. 10 o'clock is when we're starting next week. And we're joining with our, our other service. Also, I want to see these front rows filled. You say, why is that important? It says that we have hunger. And when we move back, it says maybe the hunger is laxing. I want to see these front rows filled. Young people, it's, I love to see you on the front row, okay? I love to see you on the front row. Those of us who are middle-aged, I love to see you on the front row. The reason is because it shows that you have a desire. And I can tell you one of the things I've been very pleased with Revival Center through the years is this. This church has a tendency to fill up from the front to the back. And you know what? That's a good thing because I've been in a lot of churches that only have the back three rows filled. Okay, that's, that's all that's there. Fill it up and let's see what God does. Bring somebody with you and let's see what God does. And then two weeks from today is our harvest dinner. It's going to take place after the second service. And, um, and we want you to come, bring a dessert. Here's the way this works. The way this works is this. You get a free meal. You bring a dessert. You buy it back for much more than you paid to make it <laughs> so that we raise money for our food pantry. And this is our single fundraiser that we do for our food pantry for the year. And so we want to give and give generously that day. You'll be glad that you did. It's going to be a great thing. All right. Is that good? You all good? All right. If you're not, you can talk to me later. Um, this morning, we want to give you an opportunity to give of your tithes and offerings. And um, let's hear an amen for that. Okay. And um, you can text to 810-202-0605, 810-202-0605.
or you can put it in an offering envelope and leave it in the bucket as you go today, or you can send it to us, P.O. Box 667, a Revival Center, and you'll be glad that you did, and uh, it's going to be good. Now, somebody, um, I've had several people say, Pastor, he said, oh, Pastor, why aren't you preaching as much right now? It has nothing to do with my physical health. I am physically healthy. The Lord has given me plenty of good words. But I'll tell you what the Lord spoke to my heart very strongly. He says, you need to raise up other people to preach the word, and you need to coach them. Now, how many of you know I can't help them, and we can't help them if we don't have them preach to us? All right? So it doesn't mean that I'm not preaching at all. I'll be preaching the next two Sundays after today. But I can tell you this much. God is going to raise up a generation of preachers out of this church that is going to preach all over. God's going to raise up a generation of prophets that are going to prophesy all over. God is going to raise up a generation of apostles who are going to start new ministries all over. God is going to raise up a generation of pastors who will take care of sheep. And God's going to raise up a generation of teachers who are going to teach the word with boldness so that the saints can be, be equipped everywhere we go and the kingdom of God can come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what God is doing. So how do we do that? One of the ways we do that is, you know what? We invite people to preach, we coach them as they do it, and we say amen while they do it. Amen? So this morning, we're going to have a young man. I've known him for a while. His name is Josh Markham, and he's going to share with us the fifth I Am in the I Am series that we've been preaching. Amen? Welcome, Josh, as he comes. Amen. How's everybody doing this morning? Well, it's, yeah, it's still morning. We're good. Um, so we are in the fifth week of the I Am series. And, uh, you know, I've, how many of you have, have enjoyed uh, going through the process of learning each one of these statements? And, and, and been, how many of you have been reading them, have been speaking them out in your lives every day? Yeah. Amen. Amen. It's, it absolutely makes a huge difference. Uh, I want to do that together uh, so that we could, uh, uh, I just want to hear us all say them together. It, it, you know, there is something amazing about the corporate anointing and doing that as a church body. Amen. So uh, read these with me, if you will. I am a child of God. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am a person of virtue. I am filled with the Holy Spirit. I am putting my armor on now. I am convinced that all things work together for good. I am living the abundant life in Jesus. I am a new person. I am a doer of the word. I am guarded by God's peace. I am an overcomer. I am praying for my enemies. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's, uh, let's just uh, take a moment and, and uh, just invite God this morning. Uh, Heavenly Father, your presence has been so awesome this morning. God, I thank you that we have the honor and privilege to just be in your presence. And God, I ask that you would, that you would help us to hear your word and... and and your heart this morning. And everybody said, amen. 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 This is week five. So uh, this week is, I am putting my armor on now. Um, so armor. All right. Uh, so uh, when, when I begin, begin preparing for this, um, you know, just uh, it, God kind of began taking me down a trip. So I, I have a question for you. How many of you had a superhero that was your favorite? How many of you had a superhero that was your favorite? Okay. Uh, somebody shout out their favorite superhero. Superman. 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 Batman. Batman. Wonder Woman. Spider-Man. She-Ra. <laughs> All right. That's what I, I haven't heard that name in a long time. 
All right. All right. Yeah. Now, now see, when I was growing up, I had, I had two favorite heroes. Um, and, and the first one was Superman. Okay. I, I, I grew up watching Christopher Reeves and, and you know, I'd watching him, you know, he would go into the phone booth and he, you watch him as he's taking his glasses off and he knew when he'd come out, what he, he was going to be, you know, red cape, blue, you know, big S on his chest. He would, you know, you'd even see him, he'd be running down the road and you knew what was going to happen as soon as he took the buttons on his, I don't know, he had to have ruined hundreds of shirts, right? I mean, it rips his shirt open, and, uh, and you know what's going to happen. Superman is going to take care of business, right? And then we also, I had another uh, hero that I really, uh, I liked. I, I related to him, kind of. Um, and, and it was Popeye, okay? Popeye the Sailor, right? I, 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 Popeye the Sailor was awesome. I mean, now he had, he had his nemesis, um, which was, uh, well, it, it a couple of different names that they gave him. So it was Bluto, Brutus, they, you know, they had a whole bunch of different names for his, uh, but it's the same guy. He was always mean. Um, and Popeye, he would always somehow get into this bad situation, and it was because he was being nice all the time, right? And it would, so eventually he would get into a spot where you thought that, you know, he was going to, he was going to lose the battle, and then, then somehow, a can of spinach would appear, right? And he had no idea where this can of spinach, like, I mean, it would come out of his back pocket. It would come out of his shoe. It would, like, he would, he would crash into a box and there would be spinach inside, right? And, and somehow he would get this spinach. Sometimes his lip would stick out far enough that it could dump the whole can inside of his lip all at once, right? Uh, sometimes he sucked it in through his corn cob pipe that he had, I mean, but as soon as he got that spinach, you know, he, was, he, he took care of business. All of a sudden, you know, you, you would see him eating, he flex his biceps, and like, you would see tanks rolling across his bicep. How many, how many of you, you know, I mean, it was, I loved it. Loved Popeye. Um, I, I actually, I, I stopped liking Popeye after, uh, at one point, my older brother thought that it would be fun, and so he convinced uh, my twin brother and I, now my older brother had his friends over at the house and he convinced both of us that, that, that we should pretend that we are Popeye and so we should eat grass from the backyard, okay? <laughs> we would eat grass and then that would make us, and then, then we would go at it and fight. We were both Popeye and we, you know, so after that I didn't enjoy Popeye quite as much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the big brothers, are, they're, you know, they do that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, uh, one superhero that I, I've kind of, uh, I've, I've related to a good bit, um, and it's Iron Man. How many of you know who Iron Man is? Okay. Now, Iron Man is, is uh, it, it's, Iron Man is actually a creation. It's a robot that was created by Tony Stark. Tony Stark is is a self-centered, selfish, arrogant, you know, I'm like, when you first meet Tony Stark, you know, in, in the first Iron Man movie, this, he is not a good guy, right? I mean, like, he's, he, he has made his fortune selling weapons to uh, everybody. And anyway, Iron Man, he... You know, as, as he goes through, if you watch all the Avengers movies and all of that stuff, he goes through this process where you begin to see that his priorities change. Um, what he finds important isn't what he found important when you first were introduced to him. Um, in fact, in the uh, last Avengers movie, he, his priority was to be a father and a husband. That's that's way different, isn't it? Now, I, I wanted to show you. So, when 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 I was looking at the armor of the armor of God, I I thought, you know, if Paul was around, because Paul Paul wrote about this when he was in a Roman prison, and so he saw Roman soldiers. So, I wonder how Paul would have described uh, God's armor if if he was you know if he was around today. And so so 
I'm thinking it'd be a little bit more like this. And so uh, we're going to see just how Iron Man suits up. I, know, I can't, or he won't. Stand, sorry. Like, I don't. Hey, stand down. Keep an eye on him. Thank you. I love him. Like if that was if that was uh, the armor of God that you were wearing, Amen. Yeah, you, you, all, all of a sudden, you you know, you know, as, as soon as something happened, you walked into it. You, you tapped a button on your chest, and then and then all of a sudden, it was just all around you. And you know, you you had all you know, you, you, know, you had things that came out of your back and shot. I mean, you know, how many of you have ever been in a position where you felt like you were being attacked? Have you ever wished you had that kind of armor where as soon as you saw somebody was attacking you, uh, it was just bam, you were there and, and you, you, you know. I, so I had, I had a situation that happened uh, here this last, um, about a week and a half ago. Um, I, I was at work and I, I'm doing what I'm supposed to at work. Um, and we, I, anyway, I got a phone call from our logistics manager down in uh, St. Clair, and he was wondering if our rail cars were ready to be released. And, and so I walk out of, I walk out of, uh, I work at Beer Sawmill um, in McBain, and so I'm, I was inside the planer mill, which is, it's a huge complex. Anyway, I'm, as I'm walking out, uh, walking outside, and I'm talking to the logistics manager, um, I walked out past where the Hilo puts all of the, packs of wood to um, go into the planer to be planed and 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 I'm talking on the phone and I and I'm walking and 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 the high low driver gets out of his high low and he comes over to me and starts cussing me out like I'm like he's just going off on me I really wanted to have like that were you, know, you, you ever you ever feel like you've been attacked and you wish you just could like, bam, you know, just let them have. And, and here's the, here's the thing, I felt like I was being attacked. And what was amazing was is that that for me, I didn't really have to say a whole lot. I, he actually threw out some uh, racial slurs, and I'm like, okay, I it was. Really, like this guy was—he had something else going on with him. He was—he had his issues, and somehow I got hit with it, right? And I actually—I now I, I had to end my phone call. I had to—I told him I'd call him back because this guy was going off on me, and 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 you know I called the logistics manager back after. You know, I walked away from that situation, and, and he, he said, are you all right? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. And he said, he said, really? He said, because I could hear what that guy was saying, and I wouldn't have been that calm. And I, and I thought, well, I guess, I guess it, it was a good thing I had some armor on that day. Because sometimes, you know, when, when you feel like you're getting attacked, yeah. it, it, here, here's what, I, what I've been finding. It, uh, for me, every morning when I get up, there's a couple of things that I do. I spend some time with God. I spend some time in the Word. And I also spend some time working on me, um, exercising and, and, you know, that kind of thing. So that, that I'm, I'm, I feel good and I'm ready for the day. And what I find is that, that when I start my day that way, it goes way better. It just does. Overall, my whole day goes better when I start my day by exercising and by spending some time with God, right? And I wanted to look at what the, you know, when we look at the, look at the armor of God, a couple of things that, that God has been showing me about the armor that we need to have on a daily basis, something that we need to walk with all the time in order to really be what God's called us to be, okay? Um, 
Now, in, in Ephesians chapter 6, um, in Ephesians chapter 6, it lists the, the armor of God, and Paul is, uh, is describing it for us. And I'm not going to take the time to read through it, because I think we've all, we've all read through that passage. Um, it's Ephesians 6, uh, and it starts in about verse 11, and it goes through uh, verse 18. Um, but one of the things that, that surprised me when Paul was talking about the armor of God, okay? The first thing that Paul lists was truth. It says to put on a belt, uh, put on truth like a belt. And it was, it was the truth that helps us to stand when we're dealing with all of that stuff, right? Now, here, here's what I find interesting. God, uh, Paul described it as a belt, which belts, part of, part of the purpose of a belt is to protect things that are private. Amen? Uh, uh, let, let's, be, let's be real, that's what a belt does. And it, that's what it does, it helps to protect areas of our bodies that are private. And yet, and Paul says that should be wrapped in truth. Okay, so we're supposed to protect the private things in our life with truth. Part of that means that we have to be honest with the private things in our life. If, if you are, aren't honest with yourself about the private stuff, so when, when you aren't straightforward with yourself about your thoughts and the things that, that go through your mind, it, it, what it does is it, you, you have nothing to stand on. You have no support, right? Now, he then goes on and, and he talks about the, the breastplate of righteousness. And, and when, when, I think about, when I think about what Paul would have, would have described that as today, I, it, you know, I, I, I guess what came to my mind was, was some of the stuff that, you know, that I, so I wear while riding a motorcycle. Um, so this last, uh, uh, beginning of the summer, my wife and I bought a new motorcycle so that we could have some, you know, we could go out and do some riding together and, and enjoy some time together. And, and uh, one of the things that, that, you know, my wife basically, she made it very clear that it, it, if I was out riding and not wearing a helmet, she would just sell the motorcycle. So <laughs> she made it clear that I needed to wear my, and you know, and, and truth is, it was, it, she, wanted, she wanted to make sure that I was safe and protected, amen? And that's not a bad thing at all. Now, now when we describe the, the armor of God, it talks about the helmet of salvation. Here's the thing that I, I have to make sure that I keep clear in my head. I am a sinner saved by grace. I am. Absolutely am. I am. I, without God, I'm a liar. Without God, I'm an adulterer. Without God, I'm a murderer. Hey, hey, hey how, why, why would you say that? Well, I have... I would love to tell you that I've never told a lie, but I have, okay? I would love to tell you that I've never had an improper thought, but I have, okay? I would love to tell you that I've never had hate in my heart, but I have. Jesus said that if you have hatred in your heart, it's the same as murder. If you, have, if you lust after someone, it's the same as adultery. If, if, I, this, is, this is really heart stuff. So when I'm honest about me, right? If I have the helmet of salvation, it, it reminds me that, that without God, I, do, I, I can't, I, I am all of those things. But because God has covered me through salvation, I can see things differently. Now, when I go out riding, one of the things that I, I like, uh, so my wife and I bought some helmets for riding that uh, are, are pretty cool. Um, I like this this helmet because when first of all it it's not something where I have to like squeeze my head in because the face shield pops up I like that but something that that I think is very interesting it I, I really like this is that it has a little lever here and as soon as you push it it has built-in sunglasses 
That's really cool, right? We need to have some built-in sunglasses. See, it, if, I, if I am looking at the world and I look at the world as they're doing the wrong things and I forget about the fact that it is only Jesus that puts me in a position where I can have a relationship with my Heavenly Father. So, so if I look at it through that, that lens, then I don't, I don't really have a place to judge anybody. It's kind of really hypocritical for me to judge somebody when I've, I've made just as many mistakes, right? Is that, is that truth or no? It is. Now, now, if we, when we wear the helmet of salvation, if we are seeing them through the truth about, about some of the things that are private, what ends up happening is, now, this is, this is pretty cool. I like this. Uh, this is actually, uh, I'll probably give to one of my boys because, you know, they steal my stuff anyway. So, um, this is actually for riding a dirt bike. Um, and it's protective gear. Uh, and when I began thinking about the armor of God and, and, you know, really what it means to wear a breastplate of righteousness. See, righteousness is... Being in right standing with God. And my righteousness, God's word says, is his rags, right? But when I put on God's righteousness, which means I, I, through salvation, I know that he washed me clean and I can walk in in right standing with him through the grace that God's given me and, and develop a relationship and learn to grow in that relationship. What begins to happen is that God... God begins to protect my heart. Uh, he's protecting my thoughts because I'm looking at things through salvation. He begins to protect, uh, his righteousness protects my heart. What I thought was really cool about this is this, this has this belt that, you know, it goes around your, your, your waist. Um, but what's really cool is that it, it ties into a support that goes all the way down your back. I, see, this is more what I see when I, when I picture the armor of God. Because it is something that is on me, is around me, is something that I can and ha I need to walk with every day. Now, I had the, uh, my wife and I were actually, we were in a, uh, we were on our way to go visit my uncle who was out at Camp Cadillac. And so we were heading towards the uh, north end of town. Now, we were not on our bike. Uh, we were in the car. <clears throat> and um, this was it, was, it was fairly early in the, in the summer. And um, so we're, 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 we're driving on the, we had kind of just passed the Civic Center, right? And we... We, I saw these guys, and there's four guys riding a motorcycle. Riding motorcycles, they're all riding Harleys. They're, you know, they're kind of being goofy, being whatever. You know, it's middle of summer. They're hot riding and just being a little bit foolish, that kind of thing. And these guys, these guys, um, you know, I, I, there was a car that was behind me, and and she decided to pass me, and so she sped up and got in front of me, and uh, got in front of me right before the light that's right there by Wendy's. Okay, and so. It, it kind of frustrated me a little bit uh, because this, you know, she sped up and then and then pulled in front of me and then hit her brakes because the light had changed and so you know it, that stuff's just annoying. It's not like you're getting all fired up, but it's just kind of annoying. And and those uh, the guys on the motorcycles were back behind us a little bit and and they hit the timing just right. And so they didn't have to come to a complete stop. They were in the other lane. And so the light changed and they just, you know, they just went. Well, you know, I, both of us took off and, and it, was, it was right just before we got to uh, where the country kitchen is. Um, the lady that was in front of me slammed on her brakes. I mean, like slammed on her brakes. And when she slammed on her brakes... Um, I heard the sound, and it was the sound of one of the motorcycles locking up his brakes, and then I heard the crash. 
Now, I knew what had happened. I didn't even, I didn't have to see it. I knew what had happened because it, just as all of that was going on, those four bikes had changed lanes and they got in, they were pulling into our lane. And what it, and so we knew that one of the bikes had crashed. Didn't know what he hit or what happened, but we knew one of the bikes had crashed. And it was slammed on my brakes and it was just part of me said, you need to, that I needed to get out of my car. And so as soon as, as soon as I came to a stop, I put the car in park and I opened my door. And as I stood up, I could see this Harley pinwheeling down the road. And I could see the guy, he was rolling over and over and over again in the middle of the, in the, middle of the lane. I'm just watching this guy and knowing that every time he's hitting, he's getting hurt. Okay. The guy didn't have anything on. He wasn't wearing a helmet. He didn't have a coat or any pads or any protection on. He was even wearing tennis shoes, right? The guy was goofing around and wasn't taking serious love what was going on. I mean, he was probably driving between 50 and 50 mile, 55 miles an hour when he lost control of his bike. He, when he had changed lanes, his back tire had actually hit where the patch was between the lanes, and it caught his back tire, and it, and it spun him out. What I know is that if that guy, if he had been honest with himself, okay, now, more than likely, what he was wearing had everything to do with the guys that he was riding with. Because none of them were wearing helmets. None of them were wearing any kind of protective gear. That was just, that was their deal. They were wearing, you know, had bandanas and whatever. If he had been honest with himself, and if he had looked at what the dangers might be and wore the things that protect him, he wouldn't have been in the condition that I found him in when by the time that I got up there. He didn't have a helmet on, didn't have nothing. So when I got to him, this guy was holding on to his arm. Okay, he's laying on his back. Blood is coming out of the backside of his head. He's holding on to his arm. And the reason he's holding his arm is because the bone is sticking out of his arm. I like push through, you know, sticking out. And... And, you know, there was another guy there uh, that had a first aid kit. And so me and this other guy began to, you know, start, you know, just doing some basic first aid. And, and the guy's arm was bleeding pretty significantly. And so we, I, I wrapped up his arm. And, and the guy had broke both of his legs. He had broke his ankle. He was bleeding. He had broken his arm. He, he was barely aware of what was going on. See, a lot of times we go through our days unprotected. We go through our days because we're not honest with ourselves. We don't, we don't support ourselves with truth. Now, truth is, is, is two things. So truth is is. God's word and what God says about us, and it's also being real and honest with God, right? I mean, we've got to be real and honest with God about our weaknesses, and as we're honest with him, he shows us how to begin to mature and to grow and, and, and to move past all of these things. See, what I end up finding is that when I have days that that are, you know, I, I'll have days that I start out and, it, and you know, I spend time in God's word and, and you know, and, and it starts out as a good day. But something will happen. How many of you have ever had those days where something just happens? And it's like as soon as that something happens, it kind of sends the day in a different direction. Have you ever had those days? Yeah. Now, if I'm, if I have my arm around so if I'm walking in I, I know the truth that God said about me and that I'm wearing God's righteousness so I'm, I'm accepting the, the covering that he has for me and, and I'm seeing things through salvation so I'm not 
judging people based on just what I think they should be or what they should be doing, but I'm actually, uh, you know, uh, being having grace for people and understanding that they're coming from, you know. So if I'm doing those things, you know, God's word, uh, one of the, the way that, the word that it actually uses to describe a shield of faith is to be a wraparound shield. And it actually refers to Psalms 91 um, where David describes it as, as, as being surrounded in, un, uh, underneath God's wings as, as, a, as a wraparound shield. And so it's actually being in God's presence. When that guy was, was going off on me, I can tell you that that my normal response would not be to just be calm and at peace. That, I, that's not, my flesh didn't want to do that. I allowed God to, uh, you know, I had started that day well. And so all, all of the stuff that, that that guy was flinging at me, it didn't really matter. It made sense that this is, okay, this guy is wherever he is and he's attacking me. And, and so, I, you know, all right. And it was something that we had to deal with, and, you know, disciplinary action and all that stuff down the road. But it, it, having that wrap around shield allows you to stand in peace. It does. It allows you to stand in peace. Now, here's the thing that I, that I thought was interesting when Paul describes, when Paul describes the... Um, armor of God is the word that he actually uses for the sword of the spirit, which he says is the word of God, is uh, machira, I believe is pronounced ma- machira. Anyway, it, it, that sword is actually, it's a razor sharp sword, um, but it is not the big giant sword that you would expect. You know, how many of you have seen like medieval time uh, you know, movies, that kind of stuff, where they have, you know, these big sword, but that was not the sword it was talking about. When he described the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the sword was a short, sharp sword. And it was, it was, it was meant for close hand-to-hand combat. That was the purpose of that sword. And here's what I, what, what I think that, that we have to find. So when we're being attacked from the outside, we can allow faith to be our wraparound shield. But why do we need, if faith is our wraparound shield, why do we need a sword? I think the reason why we need a sword is because exactly what happened in that situation with me, with that guy, is that after it was all done, and I walked through and did the things that I was supposed to do, and I made the right choices, after it was done, it kept replaying in my head. How many of you have that happen, where there will be those situations, and it will play over and over and over, and you think about all the things that you could have and should have and would have said, but, but you just... You just you just didn't think about it, and I would have let him. Have you ever been there? I know that there are times that, that, that I get way more upset about something after I'm outside the situation than while I was in it. While I'm in it, I do the right thing, make the right choice. I, I'm, I'm, I act professional. I, I, I act with, you know, I, I do what I'm supposed to do. But then my brain gets going after it's all done, after the adrenaline's gone. It's like, oh. The sword is meant for up close, hand-to-hand combat. And the reason why it was meant for that is because the battle that we do most of the time has nothing to do with the enemy. God's word, it says that we should renew our minds through the word, correct? So God's word also says that, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, right? It says that if we are going to do battle, then we have to learn what some of those truths are. And most of the time, the battle we do is with ourselves, You will fight your own brain more than any other thing in this world. 
in your own brain won't be the devil. It won't be the devil. James says that we are drawn away by our own desires. God doesn't tempt us. We do have the devil who, he, he's a slanderer. He talks bad about us. He, he cuts us down. He tears us down. But most of the battle that we do is with ourselves. And if we learn the word of God, if we learn what the truth is, it helps to support us and so we can stand firm where we're supposed to stand. When, when, the, when those thoughts rise up, we take them captive and we say no. I will not hold a grudge against that person for what they said. I refuse to have bitterness in my heart. I choose to forgive them. The armor of God is meant to be something we wear every day. The truth is, is the world is not getting any easier. It is getting far more difficult. The world that my kids are growing up in is far more difficult than mine when I grew up. It's just way harder. When I think about some of the difficult stuff that I face, but then I listen to... I was actually just talking the other day with my my friend Tom uh, Harrison. And and he said that it had been 11 years ago that his son committed suicide because he had been bullied. We are not living in a world that's easy to live in. And it's not getting any easier. And so we need to be prepared every day. God's word says that early in the morning we should seek him. And even late at night, did you know that if you start your day and end your day with God, most likely your day will go much better? And the stuff that you do face, because you're spending time with God in the morning, looking at what the day is going to be like, and then you spend time with God at the end of the day, looking at things that you need to work on, and God begins teaching you and showing you through his word, the more truth you have, the more battle you can do, the more prepared you are for each day. So when we say, I'm putting my armor on now, it needs to be every day, at the beginning of the day. And if you run into those moments where things make the whole day turn sour, put your armor on again. See, here's the thing. If that guy owned a helmet and he owned... Protective gear. And he had it out before he went for that ride. But then his buddy made fun of him. And so he said, nope. I'm not going to have somebody make fun of me. So many times that's what we do. We put the armor on. We talk to God. We spend time with him. But then as soon as there's somebody that says or does something that turns us the wrong way. We lay down all of those things. We take our helmet off. We, don't, we, we stop looking at them through the eyes of, I, I'm, I'm a sinner saved by grace. And if God had enough grace to save me, then God has enough grace for them. But we, when we take that off, our day goes in the wrong direction. So you want to you make a statement Say, I'm putting my armor on now. And then as soon as you run into those moments where where you can feel the day turn, say it again. Make the choice to pick up the thing that you may have laid down because your flesh flared up because you had to do some personal up-close battle and and you might have got stuck and it might have hurt. You make the choice then and you say, no, I am not going to walk through the rest of my day without my armor on. I am going to put my armor on now. Will you allow 
what other people think to cause you to put your armor down? Or will you say, I'm putting my armor on now? I want to close. I, I want one more time for us to read through the first five things because they are things that, that absolutely are going to make a difference in your life. I've, I've been thoroughly enjoying this, this series. So uh, the first one was, I am a child of God. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am a person of virtue. I am filled with the Holy Spirit. I am putting my armor on now. Are you ready to put your armor on? Will you make the choice to put your armor on every day? We're not in a time of peace. Have any of you been, have any of you felt like it's just been really peaceful lately? <laughs> We are not living in a world of peace right now. We are living in a world where we have to suit up. We got to suit up. Are you putting your armor on? Thank you, Josh. Would you stand with me? I believe that I've been encouraged to put my armor on 